A physicist calls out director Steven Spielberg about the UFO physics in his hit movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and one scene in particular. Let's dive in. This is going to be a fun episode, y'all. If you're new to the channel, you like content like this, hit that subscribe button, y'all. We put out a new video every day, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. I do not miss a day. And of course, hit that like button, y'all. That really helps out the video. So thank you so much for the support there, vetters. And of course, comment down below. What do you think of these comments by uh, this physicist I'm going to talk about here? Y'all been waiting for this video. Um, and just a real world application, right? We think of UFOs and how they operate. And then it's like, well, let's get in the nuts and bolts. You said they did X to this thing. Let's figure out how that could have happened. And that's what this video is about. It's awesome. So his name is Kevin Knuth. He is an associate professor of physics at the University of Albany. And during the Seoul Foundation Conference, it was back in November, right? They released all the videos. In his presentation, he brings up the specific scene inside of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, where the main character is in his truck, kind of at a, a train crossing, and a UFO approaches him, and his truck goes off, powers off, but then powers on all by itself. And Kevin is going to break down how that could have happened and how some of it's actually quite plausible. So, I, honestly, I found this fascinating. So, we're going to take a look at a couple clips from his presentation. And we're going to take a look at the scene from Close Encounters. So, we get an idea of, you know, exactly what he's talking about. So, let's dive in, y'all. All right. The first thing I'm going to play for y'all is just a short clip of Kevin to kind of introduce, you know, his thinking and, and how he is a little bit. Just a short clip here. And actually something that I found very important, and to be honest, something I, I quite agree with. So let's go. Thank you, Peter, for having me, and thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about what some of the strange physics about U UAPs. I'm going to call them UFOs. They're, I'm interested in the objects. And <clears throat> So I'm, I'm skeptical. You've all heard this a million times at this point, and we all know that this is code for, I'm not gonna believe a word of what you're going to tell me in the next 10 minutes, and I'm not gonna stick around very long. <laughs> and, and, <clears throat> and, and when scientists say this, it, it it's kind of bothers me because you're a scientist, you ought to be skeptical. You shouldn't need to be telling me this. I too am skeptical. I'm a scientist. I'm skeptical. Of, I am skeptical of people who assume that when they see something strange, that it's an alien spacecraft. Yes, I'm very skeptical of that. I'm also skeptical of scientists who assume that an anomalous observation has to be an error because they know their physics and there can't be anything that strange out there. I'm also skeptical of that. And this conversation usually proceeds to. You know, something like that. Oh, the UFO was anomalous. No, it's not possible. We know our physics. Um, wave their cell phone around. And, and, um, and this has come up many, many times. And it's rather surprising to me that these scientists believe that we know our physics when it is widely admitted that we don't know physics. We don't have a quantum theory of gravity. We don't. And we know that quantum mechanics makes a difference. Quantum mechanics makes a difference with Maxwell's equations and electromagnetism. That's what makes this thing work. Um, one, you would assume that quantum mechanics will probably make a difference with gravity as well. And you might be able to do some spectacular things with that. But then again, waving the cell phone around, we know our physics. Um, the cell phone is not physics. I don't know if most scientists know this yet or not. It's not physics, it's engineering. It's a triumph of engineering. And engineering is the act of using physics to find workarounds to problems. And unfamiliar engineering can look a whole lot like anomalous physics. So I am not ready to immediately jump to the conclusion that there's anomalous physics going on when we see some anomalies. I'm more inclined to think that there's clearly some clever engineering, at least. Let's start there. <clears throat> so I just wanted to start with that because I found that fascinating and spot on. I must admit, I totally agree with his first statement about like, I'm skeptical about, 
you know, someone says they saw something and they're like, it's aliens. Yeah, I'm skeptical. But again, I'm also skeptical of the other side of that coin. And I think he just summed up pretty much how I feel. And I would imagine how a lot of you feel. Um, even if you've had your own UFO experience, you, you might be skeptical of other people telling you, right? That, that just because you have your own doesn't mean, oh, well, every other story is true as well, right? Um, w- humans are known to jump to conclusions, so, you know. It can be a good and bad thing. But yeah, I just, I, I love this explanation. And then I love the second part of it, right? Such a great way to explain to somebody who's like, well, you know, we know physics are doing this. This that's impossible. R- remember, it's engineered, right? So something you're not familiar with how it's engineered could look something, right? That's, that's defying these other laws of physics. And I just, I love that explanation. Uh, because that makes so much sense, and it's a great way to explain it in such a succinct way, right? And, and look at that. In two minutes, he explained so much, in my opinion, and gave a good, rational mindset if you, you know, if you want to look into UAPs, right? You don't have to. You, you could push off that stigma very easily just knowing what's wrong with that, Right? There's obviously some sort of engineering that's, you know, mimicking or it is outside of our law of physics. And of course, we don't understand all of physics. We don't understand all of everything. We don't even know why we sleep. We don't know what happens after we die. If anything, we don't know so much. We don't even know everything that's happened on this planet. Our history. Does it make sense? We don't even know that. And it's already happened. It's fact. There is no mystery about what happened in the past. The only mystery about it is we just weren't there to witness, so we don't know, right? But it's a fact, and we don't know those facts, so we clearly don't know everything, right? And that's okay. Do you want to get to the point where it's like, yeah, we know everything. We're done. Let's just call it. What do you think? Go for pie? I mean, we know everything. You know, it's like... We don't. So I love that. I love, you know, we keep that open and we're searching our curiosity. It should never go away for humanity. It's, it's, it's what makes us so wonderful is that curiosity. So anyway, let's dive in. Let's go to the scene first from Close Encounters. We're going to watch that so that we better understand exactly what he's going to bring up and then just listen to his explanation about it. I got to say, this is probably my favorite presentation of all the soul ones. I enjoyed them all. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed this. One, I hadn't heard this guy speak too much. And I just really kind of enjoyed his, his, he added some fun, you know, to it. And kind of, but you learned like, it was great. It was great. He's, he's, he's good at this. Uh, his nervousness kind of added to it, right? His authenticity, like it was good. He was cool. Anyway, let's watch this scene. Again, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, directed by Steven Spielberg. Here you can see it came out in 1977. Clearly, uh, uh, you know, a milestone um, just in filmmaking. But also, um, if you're into, right, E.T. films, extraterrestrial films, right? And Steven Spielberg has made many about E.T.'s. And this particular scene, um, right, he talks about the lead character, Right, um, having this his first encounter with this UFO, and remember, Jacques Vallée is presented in this film. Well, somebody plays him, a character based on him in real life, right? So there's some like close ties to the Soul Conference here, and Jack Vallée is sitting like in the second row, right in front of Kevin, uh, while he's going over this. So I found that funny, but anyway, let's watch the scene.
I would be scared shitless right now, y'all. Fuck me. What do you do? He's like, where is where's that thing? Oh, Jesus. I mean, this is 1977, y'all. So good. How did they do that trick, man? So, I hope you've uh, paid special attention to when the car shuts off and when it comes on. Because that is exactly what Kevin is going to talk about. Uh, but what a great scene, right? What a great shot that is right there. Look at that. Iconic, y'all. Um, all right, let's go to that scene and have him start explaining. Here Now, there are also electric and magnetic effects. You might recall the scene from Close Encounters of the Third Kind where Richard Dreyfuss is in his truck investigating power outages and the UFO flies over his truck and the truck stops running. Um, McCampbell in 1983 had identified several automobile in interference types. You get an in engine disruption and failure. The engines sometimes fail to restart in the vicinity of a UFO and when the UFO leaves, sometimes the engine restarts. When I saw that in the movie, I was like, oh, this is just silly at this point. Engines don't just restart. <laughs> you can't just, how was the UFO magically restarting the engine? Um, <clears throat> well, if you think about the physics, you can reason through this, and this is what uh, McCampbell had done. If you have a strong enough electric field around this UFO, you could possibly be ionizing the air. How strong has this field got to be? It's got to be on the order of three times 10 to the six volts per meter. That'll short out the spark plugs in the car. It'll short out the distributor cam. So the car will stop running if it's a gasoline engine. If you have a diesel engine, like the Ford 170 in this movie, it should not stop running. Sorry, Spielberg. <laughs> so his car should not have stopped. Now, what I found fascinating, basically, what we're doing here is kind of fun. We're using a vehicle as an electric field detector. Um, I don't have to calibrate it, so I can go back and look at reports and and you can rather sometimes trust reports because people probably don't have much of a hard time telling whether their car died or not. So, all right, so if you are shorting out the spark plugs, the engine can't fire, so the engine stops running. Um, why would a car restart? Well, this is basically a circuit diagram of, of the um, circuitry in an old car, a pre-computerized car. You're shorting out the spark plug, it can't fire. You're also going to short out the distributor cam. So you've got current running through the primary of the ignition coil. So this ignition coil has a magnetic field. And the way the car works is it creates a magnetic field. It then turns off, that magnetic field collapses, induces a current, higher, a current in the secondary at a higher voltage, which goes to the spark plug and it fires. Now, when the UFO is hovering over here, you've shorted out everything, so the spark plug can't fire, but you've got a large magnetic field sitting at the primary coil. Now the UFO leaves, the switches all stop shorting out, the current stops flowing, the magnetic field collapses, induces a current in the secondary, which sends a pulse to the spark plug, 
And if you work through how the stroke of the engine works, the 720 degree cycle stroke of, a, of an engine, you find that the power stroke takes 145 degrees out of that 70 degrees, 720 degree stroke, which is about 20% of the time the piston is in a power stroke state. And about half of that time, it has got fuel in there ready to fire. That pulse comes and hits the spark plug. 10% of the time, that piston will fire. The car restarts. And if you look at the data, you find that only 10% of the cars that are stopped by a UFO restart when it leaves. The numbers match. Um, in Rodiger's catalog, he has 268 cases in which the engine stops, and in 27 of those, it restarts when it leaves. And you can understand this once you understand how the system works. Physics, it's, it's not magic. These things are not magically starting up a car. It's actually reasonable. Love that. Now the problem, what makes this really anomalous, is the electric, field, electric fields on the order of 10 to the 6 volts per meter generated by a small UFO are going to require several coulombs of charge, which is a crazy amount of electric charge. And that's about 10 to the 9th joules of energy. Again, huge, huge, huge amounts of energy. Not so surprising anymore considering the luminosity as we've seen and the maneuvers. They also create huge magnetic fields and the light in the sky is naturally polarized and these huge magnetic fields can create and can cause an effect called the Faraday effect which rotates the polarization of the light. So if you take a photograph of a UFO with a polarizing filter, which I recommend for this reason, you will see um, that you'll get rings around the UFO if it has a large magnetic field. Um, this has been observed and it's been photographed. This is a photograph that Meeson published in 2012 showing Faraday, what looked like Faraday rings around a, UA, a UFO. Um, however, Wow. Gosh, okay, um, it's, he's getting into other stuff and, you know, please go check out the video. I'm gonna put a link in the description, go check it out. It's fascinating, uh, you know, man. So now you know how to take pictures of UFOs, guys have a polarizing lens. Uh, let's figure that out. Um, yeah, fascinating. Love how there's just like real science, right, behind what people purport. Because I think that all the time when I hear stories, I, I start to, right, f fill in the gaps of like, well, how could that have happened, right? That, that would have, I would have immediately thought, okay, turn off the car. Well, how does that happen? Physics-wise, what's happening inside the engine that would make it turn on and how could they control it? And he just explains it right there. And how it comes on. Now, granted, he's saying that, the, the, you know, in the movie, they used the wrong kind of car. Now, it would be interesting to know, right, he, he distinguished between gas and diesel engine, but it would be interesting to know of those reports he brought up, right, the 200 and whatever it was, 80-something, and then 27, 10% where the engine start, were they all diesel engines? What kind of cars were they? Right, because he added that part to his story, right, about the Spielberg scene. But about the reports, I don't know, right? Were they all diesel engines? That seems highly unlikely. So there might be some scenario where part of those 10%, it was a gas engine. So I'd be curious how he would explain that. Uh, but either way, it's just fascinating to just put like a real world application to it, right? This is the kind of stuff people ask for, right? I don't know why more people, um, quote unquote, debunkers or whatever you want to call them, whatever they call themselves, like why are they not more into this, right? They, they should be um, praising this kind of study, this kind of, you know, looking into it. To be honest with you, give credit to Mick West because he, he, he said the videos were fascinating. He loved them, right? Great stuff to look into and great presentation. Like he liked, you know, I can respect that, right? Because I think he sees the science analytical side and that's, you know, go off of data. Right. So anyway, I really enjoyed Kevin's. If you thought some of them were kind of, you know, maybe a little boring or a little this, a little that, whatever. This one's a lot of fun. You learned something from it, to be honest with you. Look at all the, the things that we learned uh, today. Right. In this video. Um, so I love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. 
Um, all right, guys. We'll see you guys on tomorrow's video. Uh, really enjoyed making this one. I had a lot of fun, to be honest with you. So if you want to see more stuff like this, maybe like, you know, looking at movie scenes or something and kind of picking it apart ourselves, that could be fun. I don't know. Just throwing out ideas. I mean, let me know in the comments if that's something that could be interesting um, to do. And then I guess if you're like, yeah, that'd be cool. Give me a movie scene. What would be a cool movie scene to look at and try to break down in a real world way how it could be possible? That could be fun. Anyway, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Again, thank you all so much for all the support and for uh, watching the channel. For the new uh, comers out there, welcome betters. We'll see you tomorrow, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, I do not miss a day, y'all. Don't forget, every day's a gift.